Yeah, hi and welcome from my side. I'm Markus. And uh, today I would like to talk about how to pipeline quality. Um, pipelining will be an aspect of the talk, but not the main content. I'm trying to give you some insights of the project I'm currently working on. And yeah, we, we will see uh, what, what, what you can actually recycle or not. Okay. So I used to be a Eclipse committer. That's why I'm like connected to the Eclipse Foundation, to the EclipseCon itself. And um, like recently, last year, I um, switched companies, went to Switzerland, to the Basler Versicherung AG, and nowadays I'm working as a release manager and release engineer in that area. So all of the project insights that I will tell you today are from this project. I'm trying to give you like a bird's eye perspective of the things we do, the tools we use, the techniques we use. If I'm getting into too much detail, please raise a hand or ask a question to skip that. That might happen, but I'm trying to keep the like bird's eye perspective. About this, you will all know it, this continuous cycle of planning things you want to do, doing them, getting them into production, and planning the next things. The project I'm talking about is called Galileo. And the Galileo project at Basler Versicherung is using, they call it an OOTB approach. Have you ever heard of that? They basically bought some software from the US, from a guidewire insurance um, company, and they say it's an out-of-the-box solution. That's what OOTB stands for, out-of-the-box. You simply deploy it and it runs. Um, we use it for a, as I would say, a large-scale um, enterprise project, and we currently use um, four products of them. Um, anyone from the insurance? Um, area here, here, three guns at the back. Do you may be familiar with policy center and billing center? So basically use policy center, billing center, and the portal solution for direct offerings for end users. And in the background there's a fourth product called contact manager, but that basically doesn't matter for today, just keep in the acronyms because they will appear on certain slides because we use all of these techniques to basically manage these products to get them into production. The um, Gali uh, project itself consists of eight Scrum teams, so we are act agile, that basically do customizations of these out-of-the-box technology. So we basically extend it and adjust it for our needs. We are developing software here. Every team consists of a like a classic layout, PO. We've got dedicated Scrum Masters per team. We've got architects, developers, testers, business analysts, which is very interesting. Um, like, like each of our teams has a business analyst right from the beginning. That's um, the like interface to the um, business environment and um, business area. And basically from these eight Scrum teams that we have, there are one to two teams per product. That's basically the slicing of the teams. And I'm myself in a cross-functional teams, like we have two cross-functional teams, the integration teams, uh, the integration team that's responsible for integrating or integration points between these products. And the we call it release, maintenance, and testing quality assurance team. That's where I'm in. The overall process. It's like a classic Scrum process. We have two week sprints, um, but none of the teams is directly aligned. So all of the teams have their own sprint cycle. They all do, do two week sprints, but not like synchronized. And 
the the thing is we don't do like harmonized releases on a on the sprint end on the sprint end but basically my team is responsible to get all of the um, to get all of the releases and artifacts um, in line and ready for production. So there's no actually no shippable artifact at the end of the sprint from each team, but we like gather all of the artifacts and make sure they, they get to production. What's also very interesting, um, Basler Versicherung is doing it like everything is digital. I've seen a couple of these approaches. Um, and we are we are completely doing it. We have no like physical artifacts anymore. Everything is digital from the knowledge and documentation base in Confluence, which is deeply integrated because it comes from the same vendor, um, to our requirements and application lifecycle management tool Jira. So we do all of our uh, change requests in there, the user stories, bugs, and so on. We have uh, Git, a source code management system, and for continuous integration purposes, we use Jenkins. I think this is probably what at least part all of you are also using. And I'm trying to to give some hints and, and techniques for all of these things, talk technologies. So what does our like normal journey to production look lo looks like? Usually we have like uh, local developer machines where the developers are. Um, people who are customizing, configurating the software are working. Then they check in their software and change on a feature branch into Git. And then the CI integration begins. We, we start building that artifact. And then we try to get it to production, which is, which is the right hand. The goal is to get to production. And in between, we have like three pre-integration stages. The first pre-integration stage is test, then there's the integration stage, and the acceptance stage. And for all of these stages, we have these different products that we try to, to get into production. Like this is a screenshot. What you're just seeing here is a screenshot from a conference page at ours. And as I've mentioned before, Confluence is like the, the main knowledge base for us. And it's also, for example, um, containing these live dashboards. And they actually, like on a three minute basis, reflect what's happening in which environment. So I can see, for example, in the test environment, there's PC stands for Policy Center. There's Policy Center deployed in version um, 4.0.1.1. And, in product, and it's also in production. And there's a release candidate ready until up to the integration environment, but it's not yet on the acceptance environment. Then for the, um, all of these central environments, we have integration tests, and um, we call it system tests and end-to-end -end tests. Like, either individual components or complete systems automatically interacting with each other. And last but not least, I will not go into too much detail about batches, queues, and workflows for today, but just keep in mind that the insurance, um, insurance um, area is pretty old when it comes to information technology. And they're still used to processes they call batch processes. And these batch processes um, happen once a night, basically. So within all of these environments, we've got like things that can only be executed once a day. We also monitor these executions per environment um, within the conference dashboard that we use. The um, technical basis for this is these are individual widgets. We wrote a small um, plugin for Confluence, which is basically doing a query either against um, the running Jenkins instance to retrieve um, unit test results or test results, or it's connecting 
And we'll explain that uh, later a bit more. It's connecting to a um, graph database, Neo4j, and um, doing cipher statements against that database to derive certain business metrics, for example, like these um, amount of currently active users, for example, that comes from a Neo4j database. So we've got these pretty complex environments because like one environment in this case consists of an enterprise cluster of 12 servers that have to be for each individual release, continuous integration release, be deployed with new software versions, right? So for example, for Policy Center, there are basically two online servers, O2 and O2 and O1, and one for coordinating purposes. Um, and it's also, for example, doing, the, doing these um, nightly executions of, of batch, batch tasks and batch purposes. And we have that for all of the individual products. So we basically have 12 machines per environment to coordinate. And to do this coordination, we use Jenkins pipelines, which is also like this. This is a pipeline from the title again. Whom of you is already using Jenkins pipelines? I think it's an awesome improvement over the classic and freestyle layouts. And I would all of you who's not using it recommend to take a look at that. Um, it's, it's really nice for um, environment orchestration and build orchestration. And you can basically do all of your CI scripts, check them into a Git repository, and you either have a full scripting language, Groovy, to drive your CI, or if you want to have a more, um, more user-friendly um, job description, there's also DSL for that. That's a bit simplified, but also very powerful. So we basically drive one of these um, environments, for example, test, integration, acceptance, and production, with these Jenkins pipelines. And driving one of these um, environments usually takes up to, you can maybe do the maths, um, around about an hour to get an environment up and running with a new software um, version. Okay. For each of these environments, we are, we've established in a testing pyramid, like an agile test testing per, um, pyramid, where we try to automate as much as possible on the unit level. And then um, on the unit level, we use JUnit, or more specifically, we're using um, GUnit, but it's basically JUnit um, transferred to a um, proprietary but open source language called Gozu. And we have got, for each individual product, we have these CI set up. We are around about executing like 7,000 um, unit tests on a per commit basis, per repository, per product. When it comes to integration, to the integration level, we've got so-called eye tests, integration tests. And uh, this is like a um, conglomerate from different technologies. And um, in, its, in its core, it's using Camunda as a business process engine because as we've got these, these nightly processing tasks called batches, um, you have to have an, an, like a, process a, a process that's actually capable of executing tests across multiple days, right? So at the beginning, for example, at day one, you're in stage one, then you've got the batch processing in, in day two, it's in stage two, maybe you're up to stage five, so you need, actually need for one test execution, like five to six days in this environment. For, for a special um, execution. So we don't use JUnit for that. We started with that, but we're using a dedicated um, business process um, execution engine for that. And for the system tests, we have, um, like, it's, an, it's a web application, basically all of the components, policy center, billing center, and the portal are web applications. We're from end-to-end -end using Selenium for that in its core. Uh, we use or we wrote our own um, abstraction, test abstraction layer 
above that. It's called the Test Automation Framework. It's similar to Jubilar, but it's doing things differently. Um, and we are executing also per deployment, per environment, all of these tests um, via Selenium across multiple machines and multiple browsers. A very useful and handy approach at that stage is that we recently introduced um, a, a delta runner. So basically, these Selenium tests are also driven by JUnit, but they're like from a perspective, there are system tests and even end-to-end -end tests. So multiple products and environments and systems interact with each other. And sometimes, for example, within this insurance suite, we have like 40 systems surrounding our four systems. And sometimes not all the systems work as, work as expected, aren't available, things like that. And we wrote in like generic mechanism to rerun failed tests so that you can basically run your full test suite of, I don't know, 200 system and end-to-end -end tests, and then probably, usually, like 10% of them fail. And from these 10%, it's basically like nine out of 10 um, is a problem with the surrounding system that you actually don't wanna have interior um, system tests, but we have, and we simply apply the delta, and again, as soon as the delta is constant, which might be the case if there's a bug, then we have a look at that. So until now, I spoke about environments, test, integration, acceptance, and production. And we have these four environments for our, let's call it the current project, project plus, plus zero, or the maintenance branch or maintenance stream that we're currently on. That's what the project or the, the, the topic that's currently in production. And for the upcoming projects, we simply duplicated this infrastructure that we have. So for the next upcoming project, we have the same infrastructure components, the same environments, test, int, and acceptance. And we call these different, these copies of environments, we call them stacks. And working with stacks from a release management perspective is very, very handy because you have a lot of flexibility where to put which kind of software within the process. From these stacks, we've got currently got three stacks, apart from the maintenance one. And the general rule of thumb is you start with one stack in one stack then you go to the higher environments within that stack, and as soon as this, is, this stack is ready, you move up to the next stack. So from project three stack to the project two, project one, and finally you go to into production. For all of these um, upcoming projects that we wanna like, lead into production, we have CI integration end to end, starting from test up to acceptance, and we deploy on a nightly basis into the test environments. And into the higher environments, it's dependent on the, the quality within that environment, derived from the aspects that we have with our unit test, integration test and system tests, per coordinate within this, um, uh, this infrastructure matrix. When it comes to releases, we do different flavors of releases. Um, we've got hotfixes. And hotfixes or a hotfix, hotfix basically means this has to be in production like tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. Okay? Which means you, you, you only know that you have a defect, but maybe you don't have a solution yet. But you have to have it in production like within that week at least. Then there are like normal bug fixes that are not that critical. There are user stories that you want to get out into your system. These are like um, minor releases. And like once a year or twice a year, we do major releases uh, containing complete epics. For example, we did this year the introduction of this whole new portal component. 
mapping these kinds of releases, it, and, and we, we basically map the type of release that we have to the existing environments and stacks that we have, and, and, and try to handle that a bit. So the, the maintenance of Project Zero stack is basically, basically there for hotfixes, to get hotfixes one by one into production very, very quickly. We also use them for normal bug fixes from time to time. It depends on the, the amount of bug fixes that come per product. And all of the um, bigger stories, user stories and epics, those start at the project stages. And as soon as they go to the maintenance, we no longer call it a release because basically the release is already finished on the acceptance stage in project one but it's simply being rolled out into production. It's simply a rollout in production for bigger releases. With this approach, we do, as I said before, we are not aligning the releases with the end of the sprint, but nevertheless, we do like around about 30 releases a year, but not directly synced to an, as, an, as an, a result of a sprint. And to be honest, the, um, the, the major, like, um, we, where we currently can, can get better or quicker are the, 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 the teams themselves to give feedbacks. Like, feedback on a test integration environment, we usually expect from, in the test environment from the teams itself, on the integration environment from the product owners, they have to say, okay, yes, I can approve this bug is fixed in this environment, and then it goes to the next environment. And um, the acceptance environments, which is all also reflecting like productive data scenarios, um, those are for the, we call them application owners. They're basically a group of product owners have an application owner, and they have to approve it on that stage. And sometimes you, you need teams to do that, and that's why these teams, in my opinion, are currently the bottleneck within that process, why we need sometimes weeks and months to get into production with such a, for example, bug fix or, um, or a user story on that stage. Having these environments and multiple stacks, you need to be able to deploy different versions of your software for different stacks, for example, the project one stack, um, well, let's start with the, um, with the project two or project three stack. Um, for example, gets an epic. We've got dedicated master branches for that. So starting on a, um, on a micro um, version number level, we do master branches. And depending dependent on the, on the amount of changes that, that are planned for that release, um, it, it stays or remains within a stack and an environment. We've got a dedicated, it's not exactly like, like, like here, we've got a dedicated hotfix branch, um, like ready as soon as a new release is in production. And um, this is all, always on like hot standby as soon as a bug or a fix needs to be applied. It's, it's being done on the release hotfix branch. And this, like we've got dedicated CI jobs that might produce artifacts from these dedicated branches, like instantly on a, on a fast lane approach. And like usually for the lower environments, we simply deploy and build from master, head from master, from the individual upcoming master branches. But for all of the higher environments, like integration acceptance environments, we use um, dedicated Git, re git labels to uh, uniquely identify the correct version of the correct branch in the, in the corresponding environments. And this is very, very useful. So we can clearly distinguish which version at what point in time has been in what kind of environment causing what kind of bugs. Together with the change flow, we also required um, something to control the data that is in place. And for the data flow, we use an approach, 
it's, it's sometimes referred to as golden master approach or golden copy approach. Not sure whether you're familiar with that. It's basically you copy all of your data. Either, um, but, but, but the source is, is like the golden thing you're, you're uh, referring to. And um, we do that per environment across all of the project stacks that we have. And we do this like twice, at least twice a year from production down to acceptance. And this takes us around a weekend to do that. Like this one step, cloning and um, anonymizing data from production down to acceptance. We do this like twice a year. And um, so all of the acceptance environments are from time to time um, the same as prot, and then they kind of age, also from the data constellations. And but you have these these data states also in all of the project stacks. Other tools that we use, I wanted to highlight like three of them today. For low-level inspection and low-level like log mining, we use Splunk. Whom of you know Splunk or uses Splunk? It's a very powerful tool. I can also, if, if I have somehow access to it, use it. You can get very detailed information about long terms of, of, of times, um, since when got a bug introduced, an exception started to occur, the occurrence patterns, um, classifying them, and so on and so forth. Um, for Introspecting a uh, running system. Um, we use software called Dynatrace. Um, and within Dynatrace, we are mainly working with pure paths. Um, I can recommend that. It's, it's very powerful. Um, it's also a proprietary tool, but you can basically, across systems, track the user interaction. So beginning in the UI's front end of JavaScript, all of the events that happen there through all of the application layer, for example, in Policy Center, the service calls that got against Billing Center, and up to the host systems that we have. If you've got access to that or want to evaluate that, I can, I can recommend that. And for all of the things, we did not yet find like pre-made solutions. We built our own. And the very powerful technology we are using is, I think, um, Neo4j. It started like um, a couple of years ago. It's a different approach to model your data. It's a graph database. And it's a very easy and extendable data framework, basically, to put in nodes and edges and to, to um, get queries against that. And you, by that, you can e very easily build your own knowledge graphs. For example, we use that to put all of our test results into a Neo4j database and then after that query that and reflect it, for example, on the conference dashboards. There are still a couple of things we need to do um, with these um, huge amounts of environments and application service that we um, use. It's like around about 144 in our project and alone within our project or taking a look at, uh, at other projects, um, we have to get to a stage where we also know that the environment is somehow coded, and you can basically reproduce an environment from code. We're currently um, using Puppet and Ansible for that on an OS and an application server layer. On the, um, on the daily work, we are already working on feature branches, but haven't yet introduced a system to, to enforce code reviews before a feature branch gets merged to master. In my opinion, this is, this is mandatory, and that's one of the next things we need to do. The data management, or even test data management approach w with this golden master and golden copy is pretty cheap in, in, in terms of what you need to do to, to, to accomplish that, to get a production closed system on lower environments. But it's currently uh, an all or nothing solution. So you can't specifically pick out data. 
basically you'd get all of the data anonymized to lower environments. And that's sometimes quite a lot of data, and it's only increasing because your production system is, all, is only get, getting bigger. And having these data in lower environments is also sometimes very, very painful because this data, as you can imagine, is highly inter interconnected with states of these data in different systems. We also got lots of problems with that. It's an un unsolved issue right now. And last but not least, um, we've got a lot of legacy systems and, and legacy processes, as the batches I've mentioned. And um, yeah, we can't currently can't get rid of them. Sometimes we have to wait for a couple of days for certain stages to happen, and then you get the re result. And if it's not ex as expected, you wait again, or you change something again and wait again for these batches to run. OK. As a summary, um, I think I've, I've, I've um, rarely seen it. Um, the 100% digital approach, which with all of the, the linked information and data and up-to-date data, is perfect for us. We use, instead of um, agile artifacts and shippable artifacts after a sprint, we do like small simultaneous releases, which are working very fine for us. We have this multi-stack Jenkins-driven pipeline approach to, to connect lower and higher environments. The Agile test pyramid also works very, and, and currently still scales. We've got problems with our system tests. Um, as you can imagine, we have this per, like per coordinate, and we have like 12 coordinates. And if you need to like run all of the tests on all coordinates at the same point in time, we have got too few machines to execute. It, it roughly takes 40 hours of test execution, and we've got currently two less machines to, to execute them all in parallel. But apart from that, it scales pretty good. Using tags to drive your deployments and to identify your deployments per environment is also something I would highly, highly recommend. Um, the data management or golden data approach is also something I would highly recommend. And having a look, if you've got time, into the Neo4j as a technology is also very powerful. <clears throat> Some of the things, for example, the dashboard integrations and the S-test automation framework are publicly available on GitHub. Unfortunately, not yet Eclipse projects, but they are at least um, publicly available. And that should be it from my perspective, and I'm glad to answer some questions. Like maintaining what kind of branch is being built? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Basically, it all stops after the test environment, everything. Like for the higher environments, for integration, acceptance, and production, we, we basically do it manually. We're currently not in the stage of continuous deployment. We're, we, I'm, I'm just about to, to, to get to continuous deployment state where we, for example, continuously deploy to integration or acceptance, but we're not, not there yet. So we actually don't have to, um, to cut somewhere, uh, so, so, uh, to cut it off. We basically got for all of the, the branches that different commits happen on, we've got um, different Jenkins jobs that listen to changes, that simply pull for changes on that and verify on a certain level that that's okay or not. And we, we could manually reconnect and reconfigure which branch gets deployed to which environment. And with, um, with the Jenkins pipelines approach, you can also very easily do this with one commit across multiple stacks and say their branch four and five, for example, switch in one commit. It's very nice. Yeah, if you need full flexibility, use the scripted one. If you need a easy to use and reliable also exception case, use the DSL one. So handling unstable 
situations or um, it's, it's not that easy to do that with a scripted approach yet. Uh, the VSL is, in my opinion, easier to use. But it's, it's, it, you can't do that complex things within that. It's, very, it, it's, from another point, pretty limited. Why it's easy to, to handle exceptions correctly. Any additional? Yeah, okay. Yeah, Alex, go ahead. Me too. Okay. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, but um, from as, as I can tell from from like everyday work, like these tests run all the time and they fail all the time due to various reasons, and um, yeah, we need an approach like that because otherwise this this approach currently wouldn't scale. Yeah, thanks a lot.